Thanks very much, uh, Laurie. Morning, everyone. My name's Tom Gonzalves. I'm a uh, Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development uh, Vegetable Crop Specialist and want to welcome you to the first webinar of this year's 2021 Horticulture School Summer Webinar Series. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email uh, with a link to the uh, to the recording later on. So if you if you have to leave during uh, the webinar, realize that you can catch up later on. Um, our horticulture horticulture school team includes staff from Manitoba Agriculture Resource Development, Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, and Assiniboine Community College. And uh, basically, we're pleased to be able to uh, provide you with extension information today. Uh, today's webinar is going to be in the form of a Q&A, well, at least hopefully in the form of a Q&A. So for all the attendees, if you have any questions related to horticulture production, you can type them into the question feature on your screen and we'll do our best to provide you with answers. We're going to uh, have four short areas of discussion today. Your questions, you can send any question at any time, but we're gonna go through talking about some disease issues uh, and control, weed issues and control, uh, insect issues and control, and end with a little bit of a discussion on early season fertilizer application problems. But certainly at any time, any questions you type into the chat, we may not answer them right away if it's coming up in a part of the webinar to fall, but we will, I promise we will get to all the questions. Um, Lori, could you please launch the general questions for the webinar today, please? I sure can. Thank you. So here's our first one. And it says, how, how do you see yourself with the horticulture industry? So you can select one a producer of horticultural crops, working in agri-supply agribusiness, government or university personnel or other. So we have votes coming in. It's great to give everyone a couple more seconds here. And I'll launch the results. So people are still voting. We're at about 55%. If you have a challenge entering your um, vote, you can also type it in the questions tab and we can uh, calculate it in there as well. All right, so I will launch the results. I just have to move this. Um, producer of horticulture crops, 27%. Work in agri-supply agribusiness, 7%. Government or university personnel, 27%. And other at 40%. All right, so I will launch the second poll. If you are a horticultural producer, what size is your farm? Please select one. So zero to 4.9 acres, five to 14.9 acres, 15 to 49.9%, whoops, no, acres, <laughs> or 50 plus acres. <clears throat> All right, so waiting on some votes here. And to all of us in the staff side, panelist side, remember guys, we can't vote on this. It'll skew our, our numbers so everyone can submit their vote. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. Zero to 4.9 acres is 60%, five to 14.9 acres is 10%, 15 to 49.9 acres is 10%, and 50 plus acres at 20%. So I think we have one more, right, Tom? Yes. Okay. If you are a horticultural producer, what is the primary marketing plan for your farm, farm's horticulture crops? So if you could select one, Wholesale, retail sales from your farm, 
both of the above or farm, farmers markets or CSAs? Give everyone a couple more seconds here. I'm assuming, Tom, if you're a CSA, you will know what that stands for. Community supported agriculture. Yes, it's basically where you you sell shares in your crop before uh, you plant it, so the risk is spread around to your your buyers, and you get money up front, and hopefully everybody's happy. Okay, great. Okay, we'll give it a couple more seconds here. Votes are coming in, and all right, share these results. <clears throat> Okay, so wholesale, 0%. Retail sales from your farm, 17%. Both of the above, 33%. Farmers markets, 33%. And CSAs at 17%. All right, those are our first three. Well, thank you very much, Laurie. So uh, we're going to get started with our first part of the day. We're going to get started with our first part of the day here. So uh, we'll move to disease uh, issues here. So I'm just gonna bring up a series of slides. There we go. So in our, in our first part, the uh, Dr. Vikram Bish, Manitoba Agriculture's uh, horticulture pathologist is going to, uh, going to have a bit of a conversation with myself and uh, maybe first Lori could you launch the pathology question for today uh, I sure can thank All you right. you're welcome okay so it what types of products do you primarily use on your farm for disease control please select one synthetic fungicides, biological and or other non-synthetic products, or none. So people are voting. If you could get your vote in. It's pretty even right now. Oh, there we go. If you could select one, that would be great. And I will launch the results. Synthetic fungicides, 29%, biological, 14%, uh, and none, 57%. Okay. Okay, well, thanks very much, Lori. Um, so that's kind of interesting, Vikram. Uh, over half of the uh, attendees who responded uh, don't do anything for disease control. Any comments? Uh, that's a good sign for the organic industry. Uh, also gives an indication that uh, ours uh, is uh, a small commercial sector compared to some other provinces. We would have expected a lot more uh, use of fungicides, but uh, the market gardeners would often try to not use unless required. So that is okay. Uh, you know, what you do fits your business plan, that is good. Uh, for those who are using the synthetic fungicides, you probably are commercial, and uh, there are some organic uh, producers also. So you have options of uh, not to use fungicides too. Sure, it was uh, an interesting find, thank you. So, I. I wonder, Vikram, I wonder like seed treatments and not knowing that it's bugs are. Yeah, that's possible too. Like <laughs> seed treatment uh, could be on a, on a number of uh, producers' seed, and they might oh, not be aware. Oh, every every kernel of sweet corn. Yeah. Or uh, sweet corn, for example, is uh, normally uh, treated with the fungicides and insecticides. So. Uh, if you you are not applying it, but you get it applied that way, it is still a synthetic fungicide usage, uh, but that's okay that you are not applying it. Right. So, Vikram, I'm just wondering, 
like th this this spring, uh, have you seen any issues that have uh, come up uh, where people have producers have suspected there might be might be disease issues, but in reality, it's more of an environmental uh, concern. Yes. I got a number of uh, phone calls to, you know, find uh, what disease uh, this is. They sent uh, photographs and uh, wanted to find out uh, what fungicide to use. So <clears throat> it's quite important to learn about the background of what the problem is. And uh, the fields are rather dry. So we don't have much uh, disease problem at the moment. The only problem normally would be pythium or other fungal disease uh, uh, damping off and dry soils don't uh, help uh, that disease. So uh, the other problems are the greenhouse uh, growers uh, who raise uh, seedlings in their greenhouse for themselves or for others and uh, that sometimes uh, leads to certain issues which uh, I've got some phone calls. I have some pictures to share with you. Okay, um, here is uh, a photograph uh, from one of the uh, growers who had, uh, you know, called and said that his leaves are turning white. Uh, the plants are looking very spindly. And uh, without looking at the photograph, if I say, those few words, uh, you would say, well, there must be some uh, disease issue. But uh, when you get uh, the photographs, you look at it carefully uh, and ask about the distribution in the field. Uh, this one is uh, definitely a herbicide exposure. And uh, these are, the bottom leaves are very nice and uh, healthy and flat, the top leaves. Uh, somebody must be spraying their uh, cover crop, uh, sorry, uh, field crop uh, uh, pre-emerge. And uh, 240, like uh, fungicides, they travel far and they make irregular patterns in the uh, uh, vegetable plots or other places where they uh, land. Uh, it could expose uh, not just uh, peas, but uh, Grapes uh, get affected really badly and uh, also tomatoes. So, uh, how can I remove this? Uh, okay. Uh, so, I have, so why don't leaves not growing well? What can I spray? Those are the questions. So, now uh, from just this description in writing, you can't tell anything. But when you look at the leaves, you know that it is some kind of a herbicide damage. So uh, nothing that uh, the uh, grower has done uh, could have uh, prevented this because uh, you have to have neighbors who are careful and know where your sensitive crops are. This not only happens for uh, vegetable crops, for potatoes as well, for other horticulture crops, which are very sensitive. If you have a suspect, suspect a suspicion of uh, this 240, look at your grape leaves. They will give you very good indication. I don't have a photograph of that, but here are some tomatoes, which uh, also were exposed to the same 240 type of uh, problem. And then uh, I was talking about uh, the tomatoes. A lot of people call that I have, uh, uh, early blight uh, showing up in my leaves uh, in the greenhouse in my seedling trays. I uh, think it is too early for uh, early blight to show up uh, at this stage unless it is a you know scientific experiment where you put the disease inoculum on the leaves. So for growers, this is definitely a nutrient imbalance. The leaves uh, have uh, a lot of spots. Sometimes it is um, a bit uh, yellowish. And here is another picture where it shows really bad uh, uh, thinking. Uh, 
So go ahead. No, I'm just, I'm just saying like uh, we went on, Vikram and I went on a uh, farm call uh, a couple of days back where uh, producer was quite certain that early blight was uh, on his on his tomatoes and and yet between uh, fertility issues and uh, potential water issue, uh, there really was no disease to speak of. Yeah, there was no disease. So in the greenhouses, when you water with the uh, fertilizers, uh, the fertilizer could tend to accumulate and cause uh, certain toxicity or imbalance. And uh, this is uh, another problem that I uh, received uh, uh, grower contact. And here you see that the uh, plants were grown under the uh, plastic house. Uh, during uh, 4th and 5th of June, it was really hot and there were spots on the leaves which uh, later turned uh, yellowish and uh, uh, if it was a disease, uh, probably not because uh, this appears to be a bacterial problem, but it is too hot and too dry for bacteria to show up. Uh, this was watered when it was hot and I suspect it is heat damage and it is not a disease. Uh, we'll be in contact. Uh, so uh, these are some of the slides that I wanted to share with. And uh, just for those people who like to use uh, less uh, fungicides or chemicals, uh, these are two problems, mites and powdery mildew on many, many different crops. So. Uh, if you have a stock of this in your uh, chem shed, that will be good. Yeah, and I, I, I think the, the, one of the takeaways here is that it's important to get an assessment. When you see a problem, don't just go, ah, I know that's what it is. Have, uh, have some people, uh, more than one person, more than one source, look at it, see uh, see what they think, do some testing if it's necessary, and narrow it down to the exact cause. Because there'd be no sense in, say, with those cucumbers, for example, going out and spending a bunch of time and money putting on a fungicide. So it 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 just. But it's important it to important, be sure what you're dealing with. Yes, it is important to uh, keep track uh, if uh, the problem continues to increase or not. Yep. And so uh, okay. that's what I would suggest. Um, okay, I just want to see, did any questions come in here? I don't think so. Okay. No, we don't have any questions. Yep. Right on, just checking. Um, okay, thanks, Vikram. Um, Laurie, is Kim uh, Brown uh, on the... Uh... I'm here. Oh, right on. Okay, I'm here Kim. now. Do you, do you want to see my... I, I, sure. I have a bit of a presentation, but we were going to do a question first, right? Yeah, I, I just wanted to be sure that uh, you were there. I mean, so busy talking with Vikram, I wasn't checking who was on uh, the call there. Okay, mm -hmm. so... Again, any questions you have, uh, attendees, just type them in the chat there and we'll get to them. But uh, we'll move into sort of the second part of our discussion this morning. Uh, involves weed issues when uh, Kim Brown is the uh, weed specialist with uh, Mental Bear Culture Rural Development. And her and I are going to have a bit of a discussion. But Lori, could you launch the weed question for today, please? I sure can. Thank you. All right. So what is the primary type of weed control used on your farm? If you could select one, please. Mechanical cultivation, farm laborers with hand tools or pulling weeds by hand, plastic mulch, natural mulches, or none. Okay, votes are coming in. If you could submit your answer, that would be great. Okay. 
All right, so I will. Am I missing an, uh, an option in there, Tom? Yeah, I should have. Uh, I don't know if you're missing it. When I formulated the question, I forgot to put herbicides. So. Okay. If you use herbicides, you could also uh, put that in the questions tab, and then we can also, you know, sure. uh, reveal that as well. Um, so it's not there, but certainly feel free to uh, include that. All right. So I'm going to share the results. Okay. So we have 40% mechanical cultivation. 40% farm laborers with hand tooling weeds by hand, 10% plastic mulch, zero natural mulches, and 10% none. Okay, right on. All right. So we are now viewing Kim's screen. Yes. Okay, well, thanks very much, Tom, for having me on, and thank you to our attendees for being on. Um, I just actually just have some pictures of some weeds. I was actually out in Portage yesterday looking where uh, Tom showed me around his plots and the tunnel there, the greenhouse there, and just looking at some of the things. So I just thought we'd do a bit of weed ID as to some of the things that we're seeing. Um, and then given that, you know, most of you are either doing mechanical weed control or hand pulling like with laborers and things like that. So basically, um, yeah, you're going to be going after, you're going to be physically removing these weeds one way or the other. So I just thought we'd go through just a couple slides. Um, this is our, our friend Burdock. This is it just starting small. Now Burdock is a, a biennial. And so these guys are coming from seed probably. If we dug around in that straw, we'd find those burrs. There's other weeds in there too, but this big one here kind of looks like a wild rhubarb. Um, but you do have to watch this one um, because it is a biennial. So those second year plants can get really big, really, really fast. Um, I have found too, like they're, you really have to get that root out of them because it's a biennial, it's coming back from a really big root stock. Um, and normally though, you will see um, the burrs don't travel very far unless you're transporting them yourself or they get stuck on clothing or animals type thing. They don't fly away in the wind like dandelion fluff does and that type of thing. And the seeds themselves, um, they not really the kind of seeds that get caught up in machinery. Like sometimes a really, really small seeded weed, like a red root pigweed, um, they have tiny, tiny little seeds and they get caught everywhere. Like you just can't get them cleaned out of equipment and even, even mechanical like hose and shovels and, and, and all kinds of things that you would be using. Um, you really need to make sure for some of these weeds to clean the dirt out because there's definitely going to be weed seeds in that dirt. But this is one thing that normally you'd be digging around and you'd find some, probably some burrs right down there in the soil. And these things, yeah, like if, again, when you're digging, make sure you get the root on those things. If you trim these off, and I have personal experience with this, if you trim these off um, before they, when they start to make burrs and you trim them off, um, they'll actually just keep making burrs and seed heads further down on the stem and they'll end up making, they're almost like a dandelion that will flower right at ground level. Um, so if you do wait till they're bigger, then you need to wait until the burrs are almost fully mature and then chop it. Um, otherwise it will keep regrowing and you'll just get those burrs. It'll still keep making burrs and they just again are lower and lower and then it's harder to remove. So anyways, that was just my first picture. This is one, this is round leaf mallow. I'm kind of got a unique leaf shape here. These are the cotyledons and I think we had done a talk earlier about weed ID and we talked about cotyledons. Those are your seed leaves. They're not a true leaf and they usually look very different than, uh, than, a, than a true leaf. So these big leaves here, this would be our first one out because it's the biggest one. And then here's the next one and there's the next one. And here's a little baby one coming. But these guys kind of have a heart shaped uh, cotyledon. And then again, the leaf shape is pretty distinctive. It's a, really nothing else really looks like that. So round leaf mallow can get very, very big, tends to stay quite prostrate or quite low on the ground. And this thing can really cover the ground and, and, and you know, take a lot of nutrients, take a lot of moist, um, take a lot of uh, moisture and things like that. Um, so these can get really, really, really big plants um, if you don't get them gone. Um, this is foxtail barley. Um, I've got a close up here in a minute. So this is a bunch grass. This is a perennial and this is a short lived perennial. So three to five years. It does reproduce by seed. Um, well, it'll come back from these rootstocks too, but there's no underground creeping rootstocks like there is with the quack grass. Um, but, and this thing, it's usually very fine leafed, kind of sometimes bluey colored. Um, these are the ones with the big, uh, the, the, when the seed heads come out, the awns, they've got lots of awns and they stick to everything. They'll stick to your socks and your clothes and, and that type of thing. And they do fly around because they're light, uh, with that on it's, it's like a, 
not a, almost like a propeller or it's, it enables the, the, the seed, which is attached to the awn, it enables it to fly around a bit. And so that's this can spread that way. And these do spread and then new plants will come entirely from seed. And then something like this, this has been here for a while, obviously, because he's pretty big already. So be at least a year or two old. So, um, and when you look up, oops, oh, sorry, I thought I had another, oops. Sorry, I've actually somehow gone all the way to the end of my slide presentation. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. There, this is an uh, up close of that foxtail barley and you can see it kind of gets this bluey gray color, but lots of times plants take on different colors because of the hairs on the stem and they kind of reflect the light and they'll look uh, duller or darker. And again, this never, it's this is not a bright green plant and it's very soft. When you feel this plant, like if you touch it, it's super, super soft. Um, so anyways, you can, uh, you can see that, um, and, uh, okay, so our next, whoops, our next weed, um, this is a, a prostrate pigweed, um, it's actually in the lamb's quarter, it, we call it prostrate pigweed, but it's actually in the lamb's quarters family, so it's called by a bunch of different names, you do have to watch in, I, these weeds that are very prostrate, like a round leaf mallow, like this, like this weed here, they can get really big and cover a lot of ground, um, so they take up a lot of space, and so um, that it really it robs you of a lot of nutrients and water type thing. Um, it's kind of like a purslane. I think I have a picture of purslane. I'm not sure if I got a good enough one to put in, uh, but that's another one that really covers the ground and really, really hard to get rid of. And sometimes you just have to take this plant back and the, the, the main root on this plant is kind of right here in the middle, but this plant can get to be four or five feet across if you leave it unchecked. And so that is, um, you know, really competitive against your against your horticulture crops. So you really want to get rid of these ones because they take up a lot of space. And when they take up a lot of space, they're taking nutrients and precious water as well. This guy, just a little picture of this guy. This is common ground. So they don't get super big, but they do have a like a dandelion type head on them. So there's lots of seed that can go get put back in the soil. It flies around a little bit. Um, and they can be quite competitive in your hort crops, not so much in a field crop, but we do see quite a bit of this. Um, and and it can get quite big so um, that's just another thing to watch again it has that yellow seed head on it that looks like a dandelion seed head um, this is our, our good friend um, lambs quarters in the goosefoot family and uh, yeah so this guy these guys can get huge very quick uh, very big in our field crops we really struggle with controlling these because they get really big really quick you're not going to get control on something like this with a herbicide but luckily these are fairly easy I think to remove by cultivation or by hand pulling uh, they're not too deep rooted and even a big plant like this you can just pull that right out um, but these guys they do take again they get to be a, a big size and these guys will get to be five feet tall if left unchecked so and they do set a lot of seed back into the soil so you want to make sure with any weed control you're getting rid of your annual weeds before they set seed because that will uh, if you don't do that then you have a bigger problem next year eliminating this year's seed is not going to mean no weeds next year because the seed bank on the soil is tremendous um, but it's still uh, there's an old saying one year seeding is seven years weeding that's an old gardening saying my grandma used to say that all the time and uh, yeah, you really need to make sure these annual weeds don't set seed. Uh, this is just lamb's quarter. Sometimes you see it has this purpley stuff on it. I think that's some kind of a disease. I'm not sure if, if um, uh, Vikram could chime in. I'm not sure exactly what that is. Uh, it's never enough to kill it though. <laughs> it, it will definitely set it back. And it, it's some, uh, again, it's a, a bit of bio control, but it won't kill it. And it certainly does not eliminate lamb's quarters completely from the equation. Uh, but you do see that occasionally, this real purple stuff. Sometimes you see that too, if you ever have strawberry blight in your plants, um, that's in this same family, um, has a little red berry on it that looks like a strawberry or raspberry, and it's in this goosefoot family, and it will get quite a bit of this disease on the leaves and stuff, but uh, that is a bad one to have in your fruit crops and stuff because it does look like a fruit and uh, and it's not at all so you that is one that you want to eliminate i don't I don't have a picture of that yet, but I'm sure I'll see some of that this summer um and then your grasses, I've just got a picture here. We've got some green foxtail. When you're looking at it like this, it's really tough to get rid of. In this heat and on this black soil, um, you are going to have a carpet of green foxtail. And if I was to look down below and, and scrape back the top of that soil and get my camera really close, there are thousands of these little guys coming. And these guys will just literally form a mat and 
We see this in our corn crops too. It'll just be a mat of foxtail in between our corn rows. You really have to get rid of this. It doesn't look like much now, but it's very competitive. It really, really takes a lot of nutrients, a lot of moisture, um, and this will completely outcompete a canola crop. If you have a mat of green or yellow foxtail or barnyard grass, um, I don't have pictures of those, but this is your green foxtail. They're all very similar. Those are warm season grasses, so very similar um, life cycle or um, uh, uh, it's a C4 plant like a corn uh, so it's a warm season plant and um, they just love it they love the black um, hot soil um, they love the heat and they are very competitive so you have to get rid of these they, they don't look like much but they do a lot of damage to your yield um, especially in corn and the way to know what it is I guess it doesn't really matter if you're not using herbicides um, because some herbicides will do uh, a good job on green foxtail, maybe not as good on yellow, and some herbicides do barnyard grass and other ones don't do a good job on barnyard grass. So from a field crop standpoint, we would like to know exactly which warm season grass it is. The way to do that is to pull a leaf back and kind of look in here. I, I haven't got a very good picture. It's hard to get a really good picture, but there's a little fringe of hairs in here. The yellow fox still has longer hairs. It still has this little fringe right in here. And then there's long um, hairs that'll be all on this leaf. And then green fox still has nothing. There's no hairs at all. It's actually kind of a little shiny in here. But again, if we're doing mechanical cultivation um, or hand pulling or hand hoeing, then really we don't really care which one it is, but they really need to, to go because they're super competitive. And then we've got our red root pigweed. This you can see if I pull back this stubble, there are thousands of these guys coming. This is a warm season weed. So again, these warm season weeds are just starting now because they need more heat to get going. Um, same as, again, think when you think warm season plants, you think of your corn plants and things like that. Um, our cool season weeds are, most of our weeds are cool season, like our lamb's quarters, and they're already very large. But a lot of our red root pigweeds really just getting going. And again, we've got some little guys starting. And again, if I pull back the stubble, there's thousands of them under here. And these can be get very big and they're very prolific seed producers and they produce lots of tiny little seeds. So you do not want these things to go to seed because they will be there forever. Um, so it's just a good idea to get rid of them. And it gets to be quite a big plant. Like this thing will get to be five feet tall and a five foot tall plant, um, it, looks terrible um, but it also I mean they take a lot of nutrients and moisture to get that big so that again is taking away from the crop you're trying to grow. Canada thistle I just got a, a rare sighting of one that's starting from a seed most of our Canada thistle comes from creeping rootstocks but this guy there's a cotyledon there and we do have some Canada thistle starts from seeds so again uh, it's a perennial, We've, we worry about them coming from rootstocks, but we also don't wanna, we wanna chop them down and don't let them go to seed because we do have a number of plants every year it's less than 10%, but still, um, you know, 10% is still a big number sometimes um, that do come from seed. And again, we can see that here. Again, I, I feel that these are quite elusive sightings and I, I like to capture them on camera when I can find one of these guys with this cotyledon. So I'm very proud of myself when I find one. <laughs> so I always take pictures of them. Um, this here, this is a prickly lettuce. This is, I see more and more of this. I never used to see this years ago. I've been in the industry about 30 years now and I never used to see any of this. We do see a lot of it. And I, I think it can be pretty competitive because um, um, well, maybe not competitive, but uh, not in a field crop situation, not uh, not as much as a thistle, but again, in a hort crop situation, um, this is, it can get to be quite a big plant. And again, anything that's getting to be a big size, it's taking, it's robbing you of nutrients and, and moisture along the way to get that big. And so prickly lettuce, if you take any of those leaves, and even when it's tiny, you t the backside of a leaf has these little prickles. They're not sharp, but you can just run your finger along that and you can feel, it just feels like a whole bunch of tiny little bumps underneath. So anyways, that's prickly lettuce. And a lot of these weeds look quite similar. It can look like a dandelion. It can look like a narrow leaf chalkspeard. It can look like a sow thistle. Lots of different weeds look quite similar, but there are distinguishing characteristics like this one. And this one will have a seed head like a dandelion. A lot of these weeds um, that that they're in the, the sunflower family or it's called the Asteraceae family. So they have that dandelion type seed head. And then the so they've got the fluffy bit that uh, helps that seed fly around and um, and and it, that's how they propagate a, a good weed is able to propagate itself in you know it's able to spread quite easily and so that this is one of those weeds that does that 
So uh, this is a sow thistle. I'm not sure which one. It, I didn't dig it up. If it had a tap root on it, it would be annual. Um, but if it has a, a creeping root stock, um, I suspect it's a perennial because there's so many around it. Like this is a big one here. We got one here. We got one here. There's a whole bunch in the background. There's Canada thistle coming right here. Uh, I've got some stinkweed along the edge here. So again, but when we see a bunch of them like this, this is probably a perennial uh, uh, sow thistle. And these are things to, you know, the problem with taking these out is when you take out this plant, there's an underground root system and it's going to send up more shoots. But eventually you have to starve that root system out. You take away the above ground plants and you can get rid of it. Um, but this is one that when you pull it or, or, or hoe it out or, or cultivate it out, you're going to get more plants coming um, because of the underground root system is going to send up new plants. Whereas when you pull something like a, um, uh, like a lamb's quarters, that's not going to happen. That plant is gone. Um, there's probably lots of them, but it's not going to send up more, more plants um, from its root system because it, something like a lamb's quarters doesn't have that root system. Whereas some these can of thistles, these sow thistles, they do have that underground root system. And then I think this is just my final one. This is prostrate knotweed, and I've got a better picture. This thing grows pretty much anywhere. This is the stuff that grows in the gravel where you park your cars. Um, it can really cover the ground too. It's in the buckwheat family, and I'll just show you. Um, the buckwheat family, the uh, polygonaceae family, um, they have this ochria. It's kind of a membrane type sheath here. Wild buckwheat has it. Um, anything in that family. Curled dock has it too. That's in that family. Um, anyways, and you can kind of see it's kind of papery, membranous in here at the nodes. So a node is the bump on the stem where a new leaf comes out. Sometimes a new stem will come out as well. Anyways, you can see that ochria in there. And this is something too. It, it will grow just about anywhere. Um, I don't... I, I don't know how competitive it is because it doesn't get very big. It stays very, very low. Um, and we don't think it's very competitive. But again, it's something in hort crops competition, it, it, what we consider comp competitive in a field crop is very different than in our hort crops. Okay. And hey, Kit, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. We yeah, have no. a couple of questions. Are you all okay. right if we go into a yep. couple of questions? Yep. Yeah, I think this was my last slide anyway. So, yeah, okay. this well, is just a bigger. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so I'm just, there's one here. Uh, I know a hop farmer who is struggling with wormwood. Mm -hmm. I'm, what is the solution for it? I'm sure in hops, there's nothing that's labeled, but. Uh... Yeah, that's a tough one because it's not, it's hard to kill. It It's naturally tolerant to a number of herbicides. Um, it, like Roundup really doesn't work very well on it. Um, it's not, it's not resistant. It just doesn't work well. Um, biennial wormwood to by the name, it's biennial or, or are we talking biennial wormwood or are we talking maybe absinthe wormwood? Like the, uh, the gray stinky stuff. Wormwood. Doesn't okay. It could, could be either one. Uh, biennial wormwood is really tough to kill because it's, again, it, it, it's just naturally tolerant to a lot of herbicides. Um, I'm thinking you might be talking about absinthe, which is kind of that gray green, the really smelly right. one, not super smelly, but it smells like sage, like poultry dressing, because mm -hmm. sage is in poultry um, dressing. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. uh, I think there was an additional comment saying it was biennial wormwood. Oh, biennial. Oh, it was by now. Okay. Um, sorry, I can't see the chat when I've got my um, when I've got my slides up. Um, okay, so biennial wormwood. Yeah, I can get together a list of some of the herbicides that might work if you do want to go in and do some spot spraying. But that is a tough one. And even though the name says it's biennial, it actually will act as a biennial, which is a two year crop, which will be um, like a vegetative this year and then se produce seed next year. That's a biennial. Um, it can act as an annual. And it can also act as a winter annual. So it actually has three different life cycles, even though traditionally it was biennial, but it has a lot of different life cycles now. So it can get away on you because it's very adaptable, which is that makes it a good weed. Um, but I could get together a list of some of the chemistries. Um, your like your, your group fours, like even your two four D and that type of thing. Yeah, it's there's not a lot of great options that will really do a good job. So I can get together a list and I can get it to Tom and we can distribute it if you like. But it's um think, it's a Kim, harder in, one to get. In hops, mm -hmm. I think the biggest uh, is going to be uh, your hands or a hole in your hands or you know yeah. something along those lines. Because well, but you could spot spray, could you not? Or is that would that not be really acceptable? Yeah. 
it 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 depends on where exactly uh, wormwood is uh, weed is in relation to the crop. Mm -hmm. But in in general terms, with hops, you're probably not going to find much okay. many products that are labeled there. Yeah, uh, I, I I don't know of any actually, but I could do a search, <laughs> but I don't know of any. Yeah, oh, I was being uh, generous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were being generous. I'm pretty sure there's none. Um, yeah. If it's in an alleyway and if that's acceptable, I mean, it depends on what type of a system you have, if you're organic or if you want to be pesticide free. Um, but there, you know, spot spraying. Um, one thing that I've told lots of people to do, and we used to do this in our plots at Ag Canada when I was doing research way back in the day. Um, we used to, our backpack sprayer with our wand, um, we used to take a, a pop bottle. Um, a ha like a two liter pop bottle and cut it in half and then kind of tape that over the end of the wand. So when we sprayed, the spray had to stay yeah. inside that pop bottle and we would just set that down on top of the weed we were trying to kill. So if yeah. we were trying to kill dandelions out of our plots, we did not want to be spraying and killing some of our, you know, we didn't want to be killing our plots. We could go in and set that down right on top of a dandelion, give it a little squirt. You do have to be careful though with the dripping because it will drip down um, yeah. the edges of the, the inside of that cut off pop bottle. But that is a solution too, if you're really concerned about getting spray on, it's basically like a tiny shrouded sprayer. If you yeah. know, there's lots of guys have shrouds on sprayers or, or that type of thing, screens or shrouds, basically you're just making your own shrouded sprayer. So that is something you could try. And that way you would not be getting any drift on your, on your plants. Um, right. And that would be effective, you know, if you're uh, in an alleyway or something, but yeah. you know, to be clear, like we can't be doing anything that's off a label requirement. Kind right, of right. Yeah, yeah, that would just be for, yes, for sure, just for alleyways and things. Like, you, can, yeah, you can't be going off label. You can't be spraying stuff that isn't registered. But again, if it's in an alleyway, if it's right in amongst the plants, it, you're just going to have to be hand pulling. I don't yep. really think, though, that it's a difficult plant to get. Like, it's not got a big root system. Again, it's either a, an annual or a biennial. So even coming from a biennial, it's not a big plant. So it should be fairly easy to get, but it does have a fair bit of seed. So you've got to get that out of there before it sets seed. There's a there's a fair bit of seed off a biennial wormwood plant. Yeah, so. Right. Can you see other questions now? Yes, um, no, I can see questions, Tom. I was just going to wait until Kim's finished her presentation here. Yeah, but I just, running quickly, out of time a bit, so I tried to okay. put the issue. Okay, I just, no, I just wanted to quickly oh. add something here. Um, not, it may not apply specific to this case, but um, if our growers who are not interested in using uh, pesticides or organic in general um, do run into issues where they absolutely have to, I just wanted to address that there are some pesticide products that are specifically approved for organic and are uh, considered food grade or lower um, low risk grade. So uh, that might be something that you can look into as well. For sure. Um, and then I'll let Kim finish with her last slide and then we'll oh. go into additional. Yeah, this is just a bigger burdock plant. Again, kind of looks like a wild rhubarb. They can get really big. And again, we're a ways away from it being um, from it being uh, having burrs and, and setting seed type thing. Uh, but again, these are start, starting to get pretty big. So you want to control them when they're a lot smaller if you can, because these do get hard to hand hoe and get out of there. They have quite a root system on them. So I'm just saying by this time, and this isn't even a big one yet. So they, they get to be, imagine like trying to take out rhubarb plants midsummer. Um, it's about the same maybe worse. So anyways, that's all I had. So if you, I can give you the screen back or however you do that. And then if there yeah. is more questions I could answer. So there are actually questions Kim from John, um, okay. John Hurd. He says, mm -hmm. um, hey Kim, did you show a picture of oak leaf to goose wood? Can you mention that it is an indicator of salinity? Oh, no, I didn't. And actually, that's a really good point, John. A lot of the goosefoot family, um, I think I had said it was a, we call it a prostrate pigweed, but it's a, it's technically in that goosefoot family. Um, the pigweeds and the go goosefoot family is very is related. But the goosefoot family is actually usually an indicator of, of, sal of salinity. So that, again, from a weed standpoint, does that matter? Probably not. But from a production standpoint, from the crops you're trying to grow, then that does matter because some of your crops, I'm sure, are quite saline to, uh, intolerant like not not tolerant of salts at all um, and then again 
but salts, say salinity in soil is usually um, a water, it's not a, it is a salt issue, but it's actually an indication of a water issue. Um, if you basically have net water movement upwards through the soil, then you've got salts that actually are allowed to come with that water and stay at the surface. So you can, it's an indicator that maybe, uh, you know, you need to be looking at your watering system or, or the water status of that land or that soil or that plot wherever you know wherever we're seeing that but when we do see some of these um goosefoot plants we do see um and, and i think if you think of kosha that that is an indicator of salinity as well so if we see these plants then that's maybe a clue that we should be checking for some things a simple soil test will do that a standard soil test will measure salinity and uh then you have an idea of what what plants might be affected if your salt if your soil is getting very saline but that's a that was a great point, John. Yeah, and John also asks if there are other um, indicators of soil problems, yeah. but I think you already touched a little bit on that. Well, yeah, kosher would be a big one. Foxtail barley, same thing. And actually, I got that far. I didn't see any kosher, but that foxtail barley plant and that um, the prostrate. Again, I always call it prostrate pigweed, and I apologize because I know that's not what it is. It's actually a goosefoot. Um, that that they were basically within a few feet of each other, so they were in the same area. So there are indicator weeds. Um, kochia is a big one, but you may or may not have that in your plots uh, or in your in your fields, depending. Um, but yeah, there are indicator weeds, and sometimes certain families, like that goosefoot family, a lot of plants in that family seem to be quite saline tolerant. And so they'll they'll that's a clue for you. Yeah, and then there is just a comment from John Hurd saying, "Hey Kim, in that grass ID picture, you're showing your green thumb." <laughs> oh, my nails. <laughs> yeah. Wear dark polish. If you wear dark polish, it doesn't show the dirt. So that's all summer long. You have to wear dark nail polish. <laughs> it's not a vanity thing. It's just because I don't I I don't want people to see how dirty my nails are digging in the dirt all the time. <laughs> But thanks, Kim. Um, I think uh, we're going to move on. Uh, if there are any questions that uh, attendees have, you can still to do with weeds or, or anything, feel free to ask them. We'll we'll get to them. But we're going to move on in the formal part of the uh, presentation. Going to move into uh, into discussion on uh, insect control, entomology in general with uh, John Gavlosky, he's a uh, Manitoba Agriculture and Rural Development Entomologist. Uh, Lori, could you launch the entomology question for me, please? I sure can. Thank you. Okay, so what types of products do you primarily use on your farm for insect control? So you can select one, please. Synthetic insecticides? biological and or other non-synthetic products or none of the above are we missing anything in there tom no i think i my brain uh, cramped to do with weed control was solved once i got a little farther along and the, uh, <laughs> i apologize to attendees and kim for shortchanging uh, everyone but <laughs> Okay, I think I can launch the results now. It looks like the voting has stopped. All right. Share the results. So 43% use synthetic insecticides, 43% use biological, and 14% use none. Well, that, that's kind of telling in, 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 in itself uh, there. Um, I, I'm just kind of wondering, John, in general terms, uh, when it when it comes to uh, I guess horticulture, because that's what we're talking about right today. But uh, any comments you you'd like to make regarding uh, insects or uh, insect control at this time of year? Yeah. So what what I wanted to go over was I'll call them the big three insects that we're keeping an eye on right now, and two to be uh, looking for uh, as the season progresses. So the big three right now, flea beetles in your cruciferous vegetables, uh, cutworms, and the grasshopper hatch is just starting. So flea beetles right now, they're starting to die out, but there will probably be another one to two weeks where there will still be enough adults around that you need to watch your cruciferous vegetables carefully. 
the flea beetles that are right now on your plants are the exact same beetles that overwintered. So there's no new um, flea beetles coming out. Everything that's there came out of overwintering in the spring, made it, laid eggs, and is now dying off. If there's one complete cycle a year with the flea beetles, the, the, the ones that eat your cruciferous vegetables, and you see the adults twice, spring and late summer. So that spring uh, adult batch, again, they're starting to die out. Usually by mid-June, numbers are getting noticeably lower. And by the end of the June, uh, by the end of June, they will be quite low. So just uh, again, keep on top of the uh, flea beetle situation for another week or two. Cutworms, they're starting to turn to pupa, which is good. So that means their populations are dwindling. Um, some of the samples that have come into me, which I have subsequently adopted as lab pets, are now turning into pupae on me. So that's where we're at in the life cycle. Now it does depend on species. Uh, some species will go through their staging a bit quicker than others, um, but your, your redback cutworms, dingy cutworms, are common uh, pest species here. Um, they should be pretty much getting to be fully grown larvae or starting to turn to pupa. If you are finding small ur larvae still, you still need to keep an eye on it for a while, but uh, for a lot of people, you might start to see those cutworm populations dwindle. And same thing, one cycle per year, but it depends on the species, how they overwinter and how they start the, the season. Uh, dingy cutworm, they overwinter as a partially grown larva. They're feeding on your crop right from the time it comes up. Redback cutworm overwinters as an egg, so uh, you don't start noticing them until late May, early June. So it varies with species. And grasshopper update, we're a bit ahead of where we normally are this time of year for emergence and development. Um, the uh, grasshoppers we've been collecting uh, in our sampling, um, anywhere from first to third stage of growth, they go through five juvenile stages before they become adults. So there's a lot of hatch starting. Uh, hatch won't be done yet. We're probably somewhere between half to three quarters of the way through the hatch being complete. And the reason it's good to know that if you are looking at controlling grasshoppers, say around a field or even in a field, do note that hatch likely isn't done yet. So either that means repeat applications or something with a bit more residual. Um, there are products with residual that are easier on your pollinators and beneficial insects. Uh, um, Corrigin, Alticor, some of those products uh, are good on grasshoppers and easier on the natural enemies and pollinators. So there are options. There's brand baits like Eco Brand. I know that's a uh, popular one with some people because even though it's not organic, it's selective. It kills grasshoppers, crickets, and a few other things, but very little else. Totally harmless to bees and most natural enemies. So there are options if you're trying to control the grasshoppers in more ecological ways. So keep an eye on them as the season progresses. Uh, the numbers that we've been seeing in some areas are quite high. Uh, the other last comment I want to make regarding grasshoppers, not all grasshoppers are created equal. Uh, we've got um, roughly 80 species of grasshoppers in Manitoba. Four of those we consider pest species, and of those four, one of them is a grass specialist, meaning it likes to feed more specifically on grassy plants. That's the clear wing grasshopper. So if that's the dominant grasshopper in your, uh, say, vegetable patch, or say in your strawberries, whatever, it like clear wing won't feed on strawberries and vegetable crops. It's a grass specialist. So two striped or migratory grasshoppers there. Uh, they're very broad, um, very generalist in what they feed on. And that would be more of a concern. So, and if you're not sure of the species, uh, you can get a really good photo. We could probably help you out with that. <laughs> Those are our big three. Um, the, the two that I want you just to start keeping an eye open for, um, we do put up traps every year for diamondback moth. We'll be pulling them down in a week or two but things were very low until the last week, but they've started to pick up. 
uh, we've got some traps, I won't call them high counts, but we've got some moderate counts from the eastern, central, and northwest in our traps. So it looks to me like uh, over the last week or so, some diamondback moth have blown in. They don't overwinter well here. They get blown in from the south. Our traps are starting to pick them up now, so it means they've come in quite early. Um, it, it does mean that, oh, sorry, they've come in quite late. Uh, yes. Uh, just going to interrupt you shortly here. Do you have slides or are you, you don't have slides? Because nope. we can't see your slides. Nope, no slides. He's unplugged. I'm unplugged, totally unplugged today. Okay, uh, perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm because there was a question from Vikram. You're saying fancy slides. Oh, okay. Well, that's not surprising because there are. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. Sorry, okay. go ahead. So yeah, just keep an eye on Diamondback in the cruciferous vegetables. Now that we know that some have blown in, um, the other one that we are seeing, and not to alarm anyone, aster leaf hopper. Um, we can pick it up when we're sweeping ditches. So here. Um, to what degree and how, the, the, the big question is, are they infected with aster yellows? So um, I've collected samples from several different locations. I've sent them to a lab in Saskatoon. They are being tested to tell me uh, what percentage of them have aster yellows. If that percentage comes back um, as minuscule, next to none, then even though you've got aster leafhoppers, it will indicate that you're not at a high risk of aster yellows. If they come back and tell me that 10% of your leafhoppers had aster yellows in them, uh, that's a concern. And that means people growing sensitive crops like carrots and uh, some of the other vegetables that are quite susceptible need to start scouting. It doesn't mean get up there and spray, it means scout. It means get a net. If you've got a carrot field that's tall enough to sweep, get a net, start sweeping, see if you've got aster or leafhoppers. And if we know that they're highly infected, then that would mean, yes, uh, start thinking about control. So we'll keep you posted on that um, as the weeks progress. Yeah, I, one of the questions that's starting to come up a little bit is the, the change in the fortunes with the uh, rain. Now, going back to your grasshopper discussion, just as a place to start, would, if, if this rain continues, uh, like in some places we've had, uh, you know, an inch and a half to two inches every day for, Three, three days, four days. You know, you start adding that up. Is is there any anything uh, that could that be impacting grasshopper uh, populations? That is an excellent question. Uh, the short answer is yes. And there's a couple ways that it can impact grasshoppers. Um, now, timing of the rain is important for grasshopper control by rain. Um, heavy rains that occur in April and May and flood your ditches and fields do next to nothing because yeah. at that point our pest species are all in the egg stage the eggs are really resilient to excess moisture uh, a colleague of mine took some grasshopper eggs from one of our pest species put them in a glass of water for a week pour the water up and they hatched <laughs> so when they're in the egg stage rain isn't going to do anything to right. them once those eggs hatch which is happening now they're at their most vulnerable stage to excess rain they're tiny little nymphs, and if you have uh, a field or a ditch that they're in that gets that's basically sitting in water for a few days, they're not going to do too well. That can kill off a significant portion. We've seen that before. Uh, we had a uh, we a couple of times during my career, we've seen grasshopper populations build and get taken out uh, by some heavy June rains. That can happen, so that's one way the rain can impact them. The other way uh, rain can affect them. If we get persistent rain and humid weather, uh, there is a fungal pathogen called uh, Entomophagia grilli. It's no easier name. It's a <laughs> fungus, and uh, it doesn't do well. Uh, uh, or grasshoppers don't do well when they get it. What will happen is the grasshoppers get real sick, and uh, they're going to feed less. Eventually, they're going to move to the. They're basically like a grasshopper with a fever. And it's going to move to the top of the plants because it feels like it's overheating. And um, they, they will end up dying clinging to the top of the plants. And eventually what happens is the spores build up in the grasshopper to the point where the cuticle splits. And being at the top of the canopy, the spores can then spread to other grasshoppers easy. So the, this kind of the fungus uses grasshopper behavior to help replicate itself and spread itself. 
So uh, if you start seeing dead grass up at the top of your plants later in the year, that's good. It means that fungal pathogens kick in. Uh, but usually that happens when we get an extended period of humid weather. Right. So, okay. Friday, Sarah, is there any questions that I've missed in the chat uh, lately? No, I, don't, I don't see any, Tom. Okay, thank you. Anybody well, wants to ask any? I'm sorry, pardon me? Oh, I said there is not, no questions unless anybody is um, willing to add any more questions at this time. Okay. And uh, like I was saying before, if you got questions about any uh, anything to do with what we've already talked about or something that we haven't, feel free to ask the question and we can uh, try to get it uh, answered for you. I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on now to uh, our discussion uh, to do with early season fertilizer application problems with uh, John Hurd, who's a uh, mental agriculture and resource developments crop nutrition specialist. Uh, Lori, could you launch the uh, fertilizer uh, question uh, or poll question, please? I sure can. There it is. Thank you. You're welcome. So what is the primary source of crop nutrition on your farm? Please select one. <clears throat> Synthetic fertilizers compost and or non-synthetic soil amendments or none of the above all right so votes are coming in fast and furious <laughs> and if you have something else that you want to add to that you could also type that into the chats or questions tab and uh, sarah can see that okay i think i'll launch the results so we have 44% synthetic fertilizers, 56% compost and or non-synthetic soil amendments, and 0% none. Okay, thanks very much, Lori. It's not hiding. Hold on one second here. My, You can go ahead and go okay. out when it's done. I'm getting some challenges here. Well, it's John Hurd here. I do soil fertility work, and I'm not expecting there to be many questions today, but I did want to mention on the poll, I'm glad that not too many said none, because none to me would represent summer fallowing in order to get your nutrients, and uh, would prefer not to see people prepare their gardens or their uh, 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 commercial vegetable fields uh, with the year of summer fallow. That's, that's old school. We don't do that anymore. We don't Correct. want to do that. So I'm, I'm glad uh, that's, uh, that option was not selected. I don't have any particular comments to make uh, now that we've received some rain. My concerns uh, about fertility uh, were twofold and they were uh, connected to our dry conditions. Uh, one Vikram kind of alluded to was that if we had applied or, or if you had applied uh, uh, nutrient bands in the field and they happened to be close to roots, under dry conditions, uh, we can get toxicity. We see that frequently in field crops uh, when uh, nitrogen or uh, salty fertilizers are, are placed with the seed or too close to the seed, but that's not likely to be the case in horticultural crops. So uh, not thinking that a problem, but Vikram did show you some uh, leaf burning or scorching, and that might be somewhat typical if you were observing uh, some of that. My, my other concern was, uh, well, the reason we don't see a lot of that is because a lot of nutrients are broadcast applied to horticultural crops, uh, applied in higher amounts uh, and applied to the soil, and that tends to be safe. Problem is that if uh, it, things were broadcast and not worked in, uh, we've seen a lot of nitrogen, particularly stranded at the soil surface this year because we didn't have rains uh, for much of May. So if that had been the case, I would be concerned perhaps of nitrogen losses or temporary uh, starvation. This rain will have uh, uh, moved it, and I hope that you've received enough rain to move it into the root zone and not past the root zone. That's something maybe we'll talk about in another week or so or a couple weeks if crops start to yellow 
and if you're on sandy soils, it is possible with high rainfall that we will get a movement of uh, nitrogen in particular through the root zone. And uh, when I went back to my lot, ancient slides, before I started here, my predecessor in the soil fertility business uh, did a bunch of sampling and, and deep soil sampling and uncovered the dirty little secret that uh, horticultural producers uh, under wet conditions can pump a lot of nitrogen into the subsoil and past the root. And just a reminder that uh, better to spoon feed than to front load a lot. And it's also good to rotate your gardens or fields with a, a deep rooted crop to pick up that nitrogen uh, or a cover crop after you take off your vegetable crop. But but we'll see in a couple of weeks yeah, if I, that's a problem. I, I think you know the way the the, the season has uh, turned a little bit here for uh, for being wetter than it uh, certainly looked like it was was going to be for a while is it, going to influence well everything to do with production but fertility as well. I in in fertility I think one of the uh, the, the use of polymer coated ureas wh whatever brand there are different brands I mean but. Uh, you know, they've risen in popularity just simply because of the functionality of of that type of a product and uh, goes to your spoon feeding. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really good idea uh, because in, in, if in the, the production system or if you're adding any supplemental water with irrigation, uh, the product in the one I'm most familiar with is ESN and uh, it, it is one that, uh, uh, should perform well even when we've had that. It, it would not be doing very good if it had been left dry on the yeah. soil surface or, or dried out. Uh, but uh, uh, that is one of you know the kind of recent technologies in the last 10, 15 years that uh, I think that would be shrewd for horticultural producers to try because again, right. there's limited no no toxicity problems. For sure, and and with with the majority of uh, horticulture acres uh, being irrigated, the 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 issue that could come up in a dry land situation where the copolymer coat wasn't being broken down simply because of a dry year, it isn't usually going to be as much of a factor when it comes to irrigated horticulture production as it would in uh, in, in uh, dry land. Uh, 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 crop production. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I won't get too stressed out about uh, it not coming through the coat, providing it's just not stranded at or close to the soil yeah. surface. If it's in the soil, yeah. uh, generally there should be enough moisture to allow orderly release. Uh, but, but again, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a, yeah. a, a, a nice option for uh, big or small farmers right. to be able to use. And and it doesn't work for uh, a drip irrigation system doesn't work for for everybody, but I mean, in some crops, uh, fruit crops and vegetable crops, the use of uh, drip tube or drip tape allows, uh, again, to go to your spoon feeding, allows to uh, meter in uh, fertility on demand or requirement uh, right into the into the crop, whether it's uh, Drip tape in a regular situation, or drip tape under mulch, or or however. I, I guess that that does bring another point up. I was glad Vikram showed some uh, stressed plants there. Remember, if if you submit stressed looking plants to our our crop diagnostic laboratory or to Vikram to to eyeball, that's all you get. All you get is an eyeball or or a determination of maybe a plating if it's a disease. We do not do tissue analysis for nutrients. For that, you got to pony up and you pay pay what it costs to get it done at a lab, uh, such as AgBuys or Farmers Edge or ANL Canada. Right. They'd be the main three. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would not delay on that. Your crops are important enough that it's important to get a a value. On and most of those labs will have a, a horticultural value. If not, uh, Don or, or Tom, you shared with me the Minnesota guide. The Minnesota Commercial Vegetable Production Guide has ranges 
So uh, don't delay. If you have a mystery or problem in the field, get Vikram to look at it. But again, Vikram can't see if it's a nutrient right. problem. And, and um, I think, sorry, sorry. go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, Vikram says, please say a few words on nutritional value and herbicide, herbicide residue risks of compost. Yeah, that I, I, I think the risk or one of the risks in compost is not knowing the, the nutritional value of it. People, some folks just say, I'll put comp, I, I put this many loads of compost on my field. And that's what I do. It's just what I've done, and it works. Well, you might not know how much uh, how much nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, et cetera, all of the, the macros and the micros are are in there. Like to have an analysis of whatever you put on your field is very important. So you you know you have an idea as to what you should be putting on, and so you're not over fertilizing. I I, I think that's that's the key there when you buy synthetic fertilizer it, it it is a known quantity of npk and if there are micros it, it they're in there as well yeah as an example tom one of the growers we had uh, worked with us in a conference a few years ago had been using buying compost and not seeing good results until he actually did an analysis and found it was full of salt some some rascal yeah. was unloading salty compost on farmers. Right. Not not fair, but if you're naive, meaning yeah. if you haven't done a test of it, uh, you're getting what you pay for. So uh, don't bring salts on your farm. The other thing is is manures and and Tom, we we've had this one in the past where if you're using manure and in this particular case, people have been feeding the animals hay that harvested off the side of the road or someplace. Yeah. They've been treated with a, a herbicide like, I don't know, 2,4-D or Lontrell or something mm -hmm. like that. The animals just pee it out into the bedding, mm -hmm. and then it's in that bedding that eventually composts. But you're ending up with that compost and herbicide injury. So again, uh, I, I don't think there's a test for that. No. But again, it's buyer beware when it comes to possible contaminants like that. And um, uh, again, uh, Vikram can do an eyeball of that type of stuff. Right. But unfortunately, it's a post-mortem. Right. And and just getting back to uh, the whole idea of uh, this is the time to be thinking fertility in the sense that if you're seeing what you perceive to be an issue, by the time it is an issue, it's too late to react most times. You need to be ahead of the curve in that. So if you've if, if you have any indications that you have issues, it's now, now's the time to, to be prudent. It would be prudent to, uh, to be say, uh, PDL testing tomatoes or, or, or whatever to, to see what, what, what you have before you, you, you lose yield potential kind of thing. Um, Pratty Sarah, are there any questions in the chat? Yeah, there is one more from Vikram. I think this may be for uh, John G. There, any of these fungi infect humans? Should people handle them? Say that one more time. Sorry. Um, sh any of these fungi infect humans? Should people handle them? So that might be in relation yeah, to the yeah, they're probably talking about the pathogens for grasshoppers. Um, mm -hmm. Short answer: No. And even within grasshoppers. Uh, these fungi are somewhat targeted. So Entomophagia grilli only affects uh, grasshoppers and related insects, things in the Orthoptera, and it is selective enough that some of our pest species will be killed um, quite well. Uh, it could be quite devastating to their populations, whereas other species of grasshoppers, it barely harms them. So um, the ones that the, the fungi I talked about, very targeted. Uh, if you handled a grasshopper that had that fungus, it will do absolutely nothing to you. Can I grind them up and powder it through my field? <laughs> uh, John wants to grind them up and spread it. Um, you, you probably could assist the spread, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I've never thought about that or okay. tried it. There's probably no reason it wouldn't. 
So I can't see why yeah. not. And naturally what happens is again, that cuticle splits and the spores blow around. Yeah, so, so if you want food. to assist the, pro the process and <laughs> grab a few and yeah. Okay, right on to it. So uh, I guess I'll do a last call for questions here. Um, anything visible there, Brady Sarah? Uh, no, like there's nothing. No new right question. On. I appreciate you doing that for me. Um, okay, well, we ran a little over time, but we did get a few questions answered and my apologies for keeping you longer than I said I would. Um, I guess I uh, just want to say thanks to all of you who attended. And again, because uh, you're registered, you will get a link uh, emailed to you later that will uh, let you go back and uh, check this out if you have uh, want to catch up on something. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, staff who uh, participated today. And as always, we value your feedback, uh, positive or negative. Uh, if you have any suggestions uh, and or comments, you know, you can send them to me, you can uh, send them to any of our presenters. Uh, yeah, feel free to make uh, make suggestions if you if you have them. And on that note, I'd like to thank you again and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye. Cool.